Well, good morning, Hickory Creek Church. We're so glad you're joining us. Just a reminder, after the second song, we will be partaking in communion. Let's worship together.
Cause the God I serve knows only how to try on. See
We're here today to remember the death of our Lord Jesus Christ. This is the season when we're not wanting to think about death. We want to really think about the birth of the Savior. Somehow, this baby, somehow this manger, and the setting is different than, for example, celebrating someone's birthday as an adult. And yet, in the Gospel of Matthew and in the Gospels, Jesus is presented as the King, the King, the coming King and the returning King. And so that anticipation, if you have your cup with you and bread, we're going to be remembering what Jesus did and what Jesus has done and what he has said. I'm reading today from the Gospel of Matthew, Matthew chapter 26. Matthew 26, while they were eating, Jesus took the bread, and when he had taken, when he had given thanks, he broke it, and he gave it to his disciples, saying, take and eat, this is my body. Let's partake together what Jesus has asked us to do, and that is to remember his body. His body in which he bore our sins. His body that was there on the cross hanging in our place. His body that is broken for us so that we can have wholeness with God. Let's remember as we partake. Lord, we thank you for allowing us to remember that you have given yourself for on our behalf, in our place, for our forgiveness of sin. Thank you that we can have wholeness and peace. Thank you, Lord. We thank you in the name, above all names, the names of Jesus. Amen. I'm reading on in Matthew 26. Verse 27, then Jesus took a cup, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, drink from it, all of you. This is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. And then he says something in verse 29 that I want to camp on a minute. Because this is remembering the blood, the blood of the covenant that has been poured out. And he says, I will not drink from this fruit of the vine from now on until that day when I drink it new with you in my Father's kingdom. Talking about a second Christmas, talking about a second anticipation of Jesus returning as an anticipation when he said I will drink it with you that's the only place in the gospels where the Lord's Supper where that phrase is occurring Jesus wants to participate with us anew and in the meanwhile when we drink it we're remembering and we're celebrating the fact that he shed his blood on our behalf, making peace with God, allowing us in a relationship. Let's particip participate together. Thank you, Father, for allowing us wholeness. And thank you, Lord, for giving us something to look forward to beyond that which we can see with our eyes today. Lord Jesus, you fasted from the fruit of the vine for 2,000 years now. And we anticipate, we look forward, we yearn to drink it new with you in the kingdom. We thank you and we ask that it may be today, it may be today, 
we thank you and we pray in your name, Jesus. Amen. I'm so glad that we could be together today in the Word of God and fellowshipping together. Thank you for your participation in person, on the internet, but also through resourcing the making of disciples. You can click on the link for giving, but you can also send your um, check 
to P.O. Box 1805, Frankfort, Illinois, 60423. Just a reminder, we're very grateful for the ability to make the word of the Lord sound forth, transforming and changing lives. And today, we are in the Old Testament again, in Psalm 24, which has very known phrases. Lift up your heads, O gates, and be lifted up, O ancient doors, that the king of glory may come in. And I have a picture here of the eastern gate or the golden gate in Jerusalem that's going to be framing how we think about this passage in Psalm 24. Psalm 24 has created an aura of anticipation, this king of glory. Just like this Christmas season, there was waiting for the Messiah for hundreds of years. And now this Psalm 24 picks up on this same sentiment of, of asking us to look forward to something. And guess what? It changes how we pray. I hope Psalm 24 changes how you and I pray and how you and I live and how you and I think about the present and the future in light of this past. Let's take a look because it's going to be asking four questions. Who shall ascend the hill of the Lord? Who shall stand in his holy place? Who is this king of glory? Who is this king of glory? These four questions, and you're going to read the psalm, hopefully on your, by yourself, and you'll notice seven answers to these four questions, are going to add up to two big ideas that we need to keep in mind. It's going to give us a profile of the worshiper, someone who lives with God at the center of their life. When you're living with God at the center of your life, what does that look like? And then it's going to give us a profile of the true God. When we are worshiping the true God, who do we call him? What do we call him? What, do, what should we thinking about? Who is this God who wants to be at the center of our lives? The focus of this psalm, like the whole Bible, is not us, but on God. And that's what you see here with the seven references to the name of God. The earth is the Lord's. Who shall ascend the hill of the Lord? He will receive blessing from the Lord and righteousness from the God of his salvation. Who is this king of glory? The Lord, strong and mighty. The Lord, mighty in battle. Who is this king of glory? The Lord of hosts. At the center of this passage and all of scripture is not a person. It's not about us. It's about him. So when we think about God, when we think about the culmination of all of these names of God or these references to God, it's going to answer with an emphatic, he is the king of glory. So the last question was, who is the king of glory? He is the king of glory. Join me in prayer to this king of glory, and then let's listen to Psalm 24. King of glory, thank you for allowing us in your presence and allowing us to hear and listen and allow us to adjust and change, to repent in your light. Thank you for speaking in our darkness and orienting us. Would you please, Lord, allow this scripture passage to bring life from the inside out to us. Allow it to transform how we pray and allow it, Lord, to accomplish your purposes in this generation and the next and the next. We pray in Jesus' name, amen. So I'm going to read the slides and I would like you to listen. The earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof, the world and those who dwell therein, for he has founded it upon the seas and established it upon the rivers. Who shall ascend the hill of the Lord? And who shall stand in his holy place? He who has clean hands and a pure heart, 
who does not lift up his soul to what is false and does not swear deceitfully. He will receive blessing from the Lord and righteousness from the God of his salvation. Such is the generation of those who seek him, who seek the face of the God of Jacob. Lift up your heads, O gates, and be lifted up, O ancient doors, that the king of glory may come in. Who is this king of glory? The Lord strong and mighty, the Lord mighty in battle. Lift up your heads, O gates, and lift them up, O ancient doors, that the king of glory may come in. Who is this king of glory? The Lord of hosts, he is the king of glory. Selah, Psalm 24. By the way, we have no idea what Selah means. We still don't. There's a bunch of conjecture, and so I'm not going to add to them because the final answer is we don't know, and no, we don't want to guess. But there are a few things we do want to know, and that is we w the psalm is assuming a, a few things, and I want to make sure we're assuming it together. So on the map here, you can see that this is Israel, and everything that's taking place in this psalm, Psalm 24, is talking about the mountain, the holy place. These are grounded. In other words, when we are following God, we're following a God of history, a God of place, a God of customs and cultures. It's a real places. So this God shows up and is having a mountain, a hill, and that place is Jerusalem. Here is a modern picture of Jerusalem taken from the east, uh, and, and um, obviously this is um, a mosque currently there. And in the ancient times, Jerusalem was a place that from every part of Israel where you would approach Jerusalem, you had to go up. That's why it's a pilgrimage to go up, go up to Zion, up to Jerusalem. And when I say Jerusalem, please don't confuse it with Jerusalem, right? That is a religious-leaning lyric, and, and it's an upbeat disco house currently with deep spiritual gospel lyrics, but it, it speaks of Jerusalem, of being the home of many religions. We're thinking about Jerusalem being the home of the one and only true God. Although people have a desire to be gathered together, you cannot bring your own God. You have to bow to the God who is there. And in the Old Testament, Jerusalem was supposed to be then the home of the one and only God, and pilgrims would come far and wide to visit. The second thing I want you to notice is that the gates, there were gates in the, in the wall, but also gates in the temple, and these are, these are doors. These gates had foundations, and these gates had archers and lintels, and, and they were heavy and big. You can't move them. You're looking at the golden gate here. It's the dead center. Um, the only eastern gate in the, to the city, and it has been sealed since medieval times. Ezekiel 44 and Zechariah 14 give us this notion of the future that on that day his feet, that is Jesus, shall stand on the Mount of Olives that lies before Jerusalem on the east, and the Mount of Olives shall split in two from the east to the west and a wide valley so that one half of the mount shall move northward and the other half southward. It is, it is Jesus coming from the Mount of Olives to be able to go into his city and take repossess that, was, that which was his from the beginning. So Psalm 24 is a setting that is located in place Mount of Olives is on this side, eastern part going in. Gate is currently shut for several reasons. And verse 1 and 2, uh, we're going to read, we're going to find the profile of God. So it's going to begin with the profile of who God is. 
And then it's going to go to the profile of a worshiper. And then it's going to go back to the profile of who God is. The earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof. The world and those who dwell therein. For he has founded it upon the seas and established it upon the rivers. The first thing I want you to notice here is that God is presented in a certain way. And that is he founded the earth and upon the seas and established it upon the rivers. The true God is a creator and sustainer. That's the profile of the God you want to address. Where we are addressing the creator and the sustainer. It says here established with an ED. It looks past tense. In the Hebrew it can go past or future or, or present. He founded it upon the seas and establishes it. It is currently held together, established upon the waters. Let me remind you, the psalm begins with this fact that we are not just a blue dot in a black universe spinning around without control. No, we are founded upon the seas, we're established upon the rivers. In your prayers, have you considered using language to address God as the founder and establisher? Just so like this. Founder of this world, establisher of this place. Lord, it is by faith I believe you to be the creator. I was not there. None of us were there. So I have to choose who I'm going to believe. And I'm choosing to believe you. Because you said you created. You said you founded. You said you established. I'll tell you, when you do that, you will notice that you are centered. You're centered. Why? Because now, it's not just God working here in Jerusalem, in this area here. No, it is working from the whole world is established. Brussels all the way to Mizoram. That's how far I can get it on this map, right? You mean Brussels is also by God? Brussels, these 19 municipalities here, all, all, the, right here, they, they're all belonging to God? Yep. The capital of the comic strip? Mm -hmm. Brussels. Yep. Good fries and mussels? Yep. Mus Brussels. One of the highest standards of living in the world? Yep, it's, it's his. And, and you mean Mizoram too, way over here? And everything in between? Yep, Mizoram. For those of you who don't know Mizoram, it's a state in eastern India. The Mizo people, Mizo people, also known as the Lushai, were the inhabitants of the Indian state, now known as Mizoram. These people were headhunters for generations, and practiced human sacrifices. If you look at their culture, saturated with animistic occult practices. The Miso people too? Yep, the Miso people too. And everybody in between. I established it. I established and found it. And everything in it belongs to me. So when you, when, when that raises up then this question, we begin with the profile of God to be addressed in our prayers, but immediately we have this question, who, who, Lord, who can hang around with you? If you're that big, if you're that glorious, who shall ascend the hill of the Lord? Who shall stand in his holy place? And that's where we're going to get the profile of the worshiper. These questions are not only answered in verse 4, although the answer begins there. In verse three, 3 and 4, the answer begins in verse 4. But please, it's not going to end in verse 4. Otherwise, you're going to end with the wrong idea. First notice that the profile of a true worshiper is that they are all in. They're all in. The whole person. He who has clean hands and a pure heart. You get it? Hands, outside, heart, inside. You're completely in, who does not lift up his soul to what is false, inward, 
and does not swear deceitfully. Outward, the whole person, the hand, the heart, your thoughts does not lift up the soul. What does that mean? Lift up my soul to what is false. It means... Like Psalm 25, one says, to you, Yahweh, the special name of God, to you I lift up my soul. Look, when I lift up my soul, when I center all my affections, all my desires, all my wishes, all my energy, all my strength around Yahweh, I, my GPS is correctly centered. That's when I am with my true north. But there are people whose soul are not lifted up to Yahweh. They are lifted up to what is false. False gods don't calibrate you. They throw you wrong. False gods are idols. These are things that replace God. That's why they're false. Anything that replaces the true God is false. Success. You make success Bigger than lifting your soul to Yahweh. Politics. We make politics bigger. That's why it's false. It replaces God. And you have things like my time and then God's time. Like, like things are separated. No, that's false. Everything is his. Some people have a false God called the knowledge of God. Where they they're, they're talk about God, but they really don't have a relationship with God. Others have technology, you know, the, the, next, the next thing is what I'm living for in technology. Or comfort, when I'm comforted, I'm good. When I'm safe, that's when I'm good. Those are idols. The second item there, and does not swear deceitfully, that's it's willfully telling an untruth. You know, these are people who post stuff and repost stuff or tweet stuff and retweet stuff that are false, deceitful. Those people can't hang around with truth. They don't love truth. We can't, it, it doesn't go together. Another element of swearing deceitfully is making promises with no intentions to keep them. Promise making and promise keeping are all part of hanging around this glorious God. Words, our expressions are to build up the community of truth. Are you so much in love with the truth that you can say goodbye lies, goodbye made up stuff, goodbye conspiracy theories, goodbye, go I'm not part of that. I'm going to hang around with truth. With my word, with my in, I'm going to find out the truth and pursue the truth. Those are true worshipers. But if you think that this is a checkmark list where I go, clean hands, got it, pure heart, got it, you missed the point. Because to be a true worshiper, you have to listen to verses 5 and 6. He will receive blessing from the Lord and righteousness from the God of his salvation. Such is the generation of those who seek him, who seek the face of the God of Jacob. This last phrase, who seek the face of the God of Jacob, is problematic. You have to look at it in various versions. I'm going to go, and it would be very difficult to explain in a short period why, but this is following really the Masoretic text, the Hebrew text, such is the generation of those who seek your face, comma, Jacob. In other words, Jacob, the true Israelite, true Israel, are people who seek God's face. Let me summarize it. Look, true worshipers are seekers. They are seeking a relationship with the living God. They commune with him. They seek out his presence. They care what he thinks, what he says. They look at what he does, and we imitate him. It's a walk. It's a lifetime, a lifestyle. The God, the God who once 
a relationship is looking for people that are worshiping him. Torah seekers, which is Psalm 19, the, the, the Torah, the word of God, living with the word of God is seeking the word of God. That's why you want to have daily practices, weekly habits, monthly routines where you will stay with the word of God in community being taught with others. In the New Testament, I have a question for you. You remember our Lord Jesus? He had the same sentiment when he was talking to the Samaritan woman at the well. He said in John 4, 23, true worshipers will worship the Father in the spirit and in truth, for they are the kind of worshipers the Father seeks. Do you know that the Father is seeking something? He's seeking men and women. He's seeking you to worship him in the spirit and in truth. My question is, have you substituted a walk with the spirit with a checkmark Christianity? Been online to church, done. Gave, done. Prayed, done. Done, done. What about a living relationship? And notice, this is self-evaluation. This is not declared by somebody. Somebody declares this over you. No, you're constantly asking, Lord, where are you? How can I join you? What, who are, what are you saying during this time? Am I hearing you clearly? Can I talk to you? Can you talk to me? And it gives you assurance that you can indeed approach the true God. So, let's take a look. We've seen the profile of the worshiper. Now let's take a look at the profile of the true God. The profile of the true God begins here um, in verses um, 7 to 10. I'm going to be reading them. And if there is a phrase that should stick out to you, it's this phrase, the king of glory. Do you know why it should stick out to you? First of all, it's never used anywhere else in the Bible. And the only place where it's used is here. It's used five times. So if you walk away going, what was Psalm 24 about? Please answer this. The king of glory wants a response from me. The king of glory wants me to respond to him. I'm going to read verses 7 to 10. Lift up your heads, O gates, and be lifted up, O ancient doors, that the king of glory may come in. Who is this king of glory? The Lord strong and mighty, the Lord mighty in battle. I know some people are offended by battles and war, but guess what? There is a war going on, and God is presented as the mighty warrior, mighty in battle. There is an arch enemy to our soul, to your soul. This is not a neutral world. This world is in animosity against the living God. Who is this king of glory? The Lord strong and mighty. The Lord mighty in battle. Lift up your heads, O gates, and lift them up, O ancient doors, that the king of glory may come in. Now I'm going to do something in verse 10. I'm going to highlight something that doesn't come out in the English, but is there in the Hebrew. Who then really is this king of glory? The Lord of hosts. That's the full name of God. The Lord of hosts. He is the king of glory. That's emphasized. He is the king of glory. The divine name is referenced six times, and the sixth time is the full form here in verse 10, the Lord of hosts. But the one that sticks out, the epitaph, description of who the Lord of hosts is, hosts is the Lord of armies. The epitaph that sticks out is the, the word glory, king of glory. You know what should come to your mind when you take a look at that? It's a visual. It's blinding. It's splendid. 
It's bright light. How do we say what is really unsayable about God? How? He's glorious. We, it leaves us stunned. When we look at Psalm 19, which is part of this sequence of Psalms, it's so splendid. God's glory is so splendid. He has to play it out on the heavens, on the scale of heavens. It, it, it can't be contained in heavens and earth. And guess what? Psalm 19 says, speech goes out forth day and night. So much glory, it's going to come day and night. And it arrives in language that, that, that are not even, cannot even be heard or understood. Glory so stunning, says Exodus 14, Exodus 40, Numbers 10, and even 1 Samuel 4 and 5, where the false god Dagon, Dagon from the Philistines falls down because this glorious presence of our God. God is so splendid, so radiant, so sublime, so awe-inspiring, glamorous, grand, fabulous, stunning, spectacular, brilliant, beaming. John, the apostle, who had spent time with Jesus on earth, now sees Jesus in John chapter, in Revelation chapter 1, verse 17. This John is on an island, Patmos, and he encounters the resurrected Jesus. The resurrected Jesus is described, and one of the descriptions is this. His face was like the sun, shining in all of its brilliance in chapter 1, verse 16. And you know what? John the Apostle says this. When I saw him, I fell at his feet, though dead, as though dead. That's the response to the Lord of glory. And verse 18, Jesus reaches out his hand, his right hand, and he put it on John, and he says, do not be afraid. Do not be afraid. I am the first and the last. I am the living one. I was dead. And now look, look, I'm alive forever and ever. And, ching -ling 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 -ling, I hold the keys of death and Hades. That portal, that door that no one wants to go through, that I've gone through it. I'm holding, I have victory. This is the God who said in Isaiah 42 in the Old Testament, I give my glory to no one else. And this is especially powerful when you see Babylon and the Babylonian gods in exile as though they have won. No, I give my glory to no one else. If the God of the Old Testament is not sharing his glory in the Old Testament, he's not doing it in the New Testament either. And yet Jesus has this glory. Do you know this Jesus? Is this Jesus still glorious, splendid? Well, I'll tell you, in Brussels, he is. And not only in Brussels, but in all over the world, people put their heart and soul in a song every year, again and again, celebrating this question. Who is this king of glory? The Lord of hosts. Listen in as they sing it for us from Handel's Messiah. God, the God of glory, the King of glory, whenever you have an encounter with him, requires adjustments. Lift up your heads, O gates, and be lifted up, O ancient doors, that the King of glory may come in. He is so splendid, he is so glorious, the gates have to be adjusted. The gates of the temple, the gates of the city, 
The object that needs to come in is too large to be contained. In Isaiah 6, 1, it was the train of the robe of Yahweh that filled the temple. It wasn't even Yahweh. It was just the train of Yahweh. And in 2 Corinthians in the New Testament, Paul says, we have this treasure of God in jars of clay, which is our bodies, to show that this all-surpassing power is from God and not from us. Read that sometimes. 2 Corinthians 4, 7. It's not the physical limits that hinder the entry of king. It is his extraordinary splendor. I think Psalm 24 is asking you and I to think of the king of glory like Ephesians 3.20 says. Now to him who is able to do immeasurably more than all we ask or imagine. I'm a person with a lot of imagination. You know that. I have a lot. But this week, I had an answer of prayer that blew my imagination. I, 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 can, I, can, I can't imagine. I, I wouldn't imagine it. According to his power that is at work within us. Do you know this God and King of glory? And any time we call on him, we're actually asking him to show up and defeat. Like when we're going to sing the song, Another in the Fire... That is what we're referring to. This is another medal for the God defeating the heat of the king who suppressed righteousness. Psalm 24 is part of a sequence of psalms that begins with the same question in Psalm 15. Who may live in the holy mountain? Who may ascend the mountain of the Lord? And the journey goes up, Psalm 19, and it comes back down over here, and what you're noticing is that Psalm 19, God's glory declared through Torah, is actually accompanied by the presence of God. The presence of God. Let's sing about that with this song, Another in the Fire. God, our Lord in heaven, hear our prayers as we adjust our small vision of you to seeing you and believing you and allowing you entrance, adjusting for your splendor. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.
So today we had an evaluation. When you are seeking God, do you relate to Him as the God of glory? Think about that in your prayer time. Number two, do I recognize that there is a battle going on to rob or cloud the glory of God? Am I fighting in my own power? Think about that. And number three, am I aware that the creator possessor of the world blesses his worshipers? That's amazing that he has time for us. And the people from Mizoram, remember the headhunters, the animists? They had an encounter with the living God, Jesus Christ, who in John 1.14 says, The Word became flesh and made His dwelling among us. We have seen His glory, the glory of the one and only Son, who came from the Father, full of grace and truth. And when the people from Mizoram, Mizoram met this living Jesus, it changed their singing. Does it change your singing? Does it change your walk? Go with this song as a proof that God is working among the nations.